Hello and welcome to lesson 63 of the Learning Guitar series. Um, in this particular lesson we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at the second shape of melodic minor, in this case we're looking at the shape of D minor. And uh, But also we're going to take uh, this as an opportunity to discuss some more uh, harmony and theory and uh, some very interesting concepts which are not just uh, you know theoretical and you'll see in a second uh, what I mean by that in terms of how we ap I applied um, some harmony and theory to, um, to the way I deployed the, the, the backing track which is associated with this, uh, with this lesson and that I have already uploaded uh, to, to YouTube. Anyway, let's go in stages. Uh, before I do that, uh, I would like to thank the, the Patreon who are supporting this project and, and the people who are subscribing to YouTube and, uh, you know, thank you for your question that you send me and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to interact with you. And also for, you know, the compliments sometimes you pay me. It's always nice to read about it. So, Melodic Minor. Um, in the previous lesson, we looked at the intervals in the, using the shape of E minor. So we were looking basically at this particular uh, chord. <laughs> And we looked at intervals generating from, you know, this shape. In this lesson, we were basically looking at the next shape in the cage. And in this case, is the shape of D minor. And when we look at chords, we actually it's going to be D minor major 7, by the way. But for the moment, let's, let's, let's keep it simple. So the shape of D minor, in this case, the chord is G minor. I'm sticking with G in this case. And basically, we're looking at a series of intervals generated from this scale. As usual, this lesson comes with a, with a PDF detailed, uh, detailing all the intervals and double stops. Let me show it to you. So here we have basically melodic minor, shape of D minor, intervals of seconds, thirds, thirds, reverse, rev stands for reversed, uh, alt stands for alternated A and alternated B, and then the double stops. And you have this for thirds, fourths intervals, fifths intervals, sixth intervals, octaves, until the octaves. In other words, basically we are dissecting, we're dissecting the scale. Uh, and look at it from different angles, and in the future we'll look at it even from more, uh, from more point of view, from more angles. The concept is always the same, basically the scale itself is just a letter of the alphabet, and then doing intervals or triads, etc. will be like kind of formulating words, and then from words we'll be formulating sentences when you're basically like playing, that's the reason for the backing track. And having to create a backing track for this second lesson gave me the opportunity to I mean, to think about certain stuff and how I wanted to deploy it. And I'm actually going to share it with you how I went around it. And because there is some interesting concept um, embedded into it. First of all, I actually took a screenshot of uh, what the thumbnail for, for uh, the, um, the, the backing track looks like. And so basically you have four bars of G minor, four bars of B minor, four bars of E flat minor, four bars back to G minor, back to E flat and then back to B. So basically it's going up and then basically backwards. And you might wonder why am I thinking that? Well, the reason is I want you to practice, to try and practice basically both the shapes that you're learning. So in this case of G minor, now you will have basically two shapes. And then basically you're transposing that into B minor and then you're transposing that into E flat. You might wonder why B minor, why E flat. Basically, the logic behind it is, at least that I'm using in this case, is here is your G minor, and because it's four bars and the and the, and the backing and the backing track is rather on the slow side of things, I think it's 70 or 80 BPM. So it takes four bars of G. It actually takes a bit of time. Then you can spend two bars over this chord and two bars over this chord. Now you're here in the neck, and the next chord is B minor, so you're back to the shape of E minor, but in this area of the neck, in fact, this is B minor. Two bars on it. And then you are in, still in B minor, and you are in this area of the neck now. Now you're moving to E flat minor, which is here. For two bars, and maybe spend two bars on this shape. 
from E flat, you're going to G, and now you're up here. So basically, you're on, you know, fret 15, you know? For two bars, and you have this. From G, we're going back to E flat. So we're going back to this. From E flat, we're going back to B. And from B, we're going back to G. So as you can see, there is a logic behind the backing track in terms of allowing you to practice these two shapes, but at the same time, I play across the neck. That was the first idea. And of course, like the backing track, you know, you're basically trying to create sentences. That's the entire idea. That's why I published this backing track. So you can, they're designed to practice what you've just done in the lesson. It's not just random. <laughs> and um, so ideally, once you studied the intervals, hopefully you've already done the intervals for the first shape and now you're doing the intervals for the second shape. And that's muscle memory, you know, take your time. I publish a lesson every three weeks for that, for that reason. But maybe like, you know, after a couple of hours of practice or one hour of practice, spend one hour with the backing track trying to apply straight away. Because as I said, like those intervals are kind of mm, little snippets of sentences. Try and create your sentences because they belong to you. Um, that's the reason I'm not suggesting licks. You know, they belong to somebody else. At some point, you know, when you want to study them, do study them, but study them just with the optics of understanding what this other player is doing. I want to do the muscle memory of it, personal opinion though. Now, there is another concept which was interesting about the backing track is, okay, I have four bars of G minor and um, that can get quite boring from an harmonic point of view. And by harmonic, I mean chords. It's like you play... It's not very interesting. So I used Army and Theory to, well, I knew this stuff. Well, let's, let's say that I, in this case, because I broke it down for you and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. Um, I wanted the, the, the harmony to allow us in the backing track to be able to play not only melodic minor, but also Dorian and also minor pentatonic. So when you're practicing to that backing track, you can use any of these three scales. And how did I do that? But and, and at the same time, how, how can I do that, but at the same time using chords which don't get in the way of this idea of being able to play three things. Let me show you what I got. So here I have um, the chromatic scale, just written by number. So this, the, the number one will define what the key is. And the various names that every interval can take. But what's more important is, here is the Dorian scale. And the Dorian scale is 1, 2, flat 3, I put some X's so you understand. 1, 2, flat 3, 4, 5, 6, flat 7. And that's the Dorian scale. If 1 is G, this will be G Dorian. You play these intervals. If 1 is B, this will be B Dorian. Melodic minor is the same as Dorian. As you can see, they have a lot of notes which are exactly in common, except the major 7. So while Dorian has got a flat 7, and melodic minor has got a major 7 instead in the scale. And we kind of knew that. Also, minor pentatonic has a lot in common with Dorian. The, the 1 is in common, the flat 3 is in common, the 4 is in common, the 5 is in common, the flat 7 is in common. Now, let's dig even a little bit deeper. So, once we establish this, okay, Dorian has got an horizontal structure, which is basically the scale, what, what I just described to you. 1, 2, flat 3, 4, 5, 6, flat 7. I can see that scale also as a, as a vertical structure, as an arpeggio basically. And the notes are exactly the same, just spelled vertically. 1 flat 3, here is the flat 3. 5, here is the 5. Flat 7, here is the flat 7. 9, don't forget that 9 is equal to 2, it's just performed an octave higher, so here is the 2. 4, which is also like an 11 because it's performed an octave higher, is here, here is the 4th. And the 6, oh I wrote 9 here, sorry, that's the 6, my mistake is equal to a 13. In other words, I can spell Dorian both as an horizontal structure, which means a scale, but I can also spell it as an arpeggio. And this is 1, flat 3, 5, flat 7, 9, 11, and 13. 
and back to the root note. This applies, to, I'm doing it in G minor, but it will be the same in, say, in B flat. Don't forget the guitar is a transposing instrument. Um, so, that's the next logical step. Let's move on. From this, I can derive two things. I did this in G, but as I said, the guitar is a transposing instrument, you could think of this in any key. But the reason I decided to put a, a key in this case, because I want, I want you to look at the actual notes here. So the original structure of a G Dorian would imply these notes, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. And this is the same notes as you can see, but as a vertical structure. What I want you to pay attention is, is the fact that as a chord, the first three notes here, when you look at it vertically, the vertical structure, G, B flat, and D is actually one flat three flat five, that spells G minor. So if I play those three notes simultaneously, so instead of playing them as a minor triad, instead of playing them like this, as an arpeggio, if I play them simultaneously, now I have a chord. Um, Let's say this, for example. That would be a G minor. It's an inversion of it. If I wanted to play one flat three five here, it would be this. And that's a G minor. But so something else we can notice beside you know the G minor triad is that if I move through the entire modal arpeggio, so this is a Dorian arpeggio. If I look at 9, 11, and 13, the notes A, C, and E, they actually spell an A minor triad. Why is this interesting? Well, in the context of the backing track that I was creating, I was thinking, okay, I want a backing track that allows me to practice uh, the Dorian, uh, pentatonic, but also melodic minor. We know that the pentatonic is contained into Dorian, as I demonstrated to you, and that the only difference in between Melodic minor and uh, Dorian is actually in the seven. So uh, there is a flat seven in Dorian and there is a major seven in melodic minor. So how about if I started moving chords around by not including the flat seven or the major seven? So keeping them kind of natural to both. And of course, if I use just the G minor triad with a bass of G, sure, it's common to all three scales. But what I just showed you What's interesting here is that I can also use a so-called slash chord, so which is this. And a slash chord, what it means is basically, in this case, you're playing a triad. It could, it, the chord could be a four-note chords, as we will see in the future. But in this case, we're using triads. An A minor triad, but with a bass of G. That's what the meaning of a slash chord, in case you didn't know. And if I start alternating, say, over G, G minor, and then A minor with a bass of G, chord-wise, what happens is I'm still not compromising the fact that I can use all three scales without actually adding any alteration. This is a, a, a G minor triad. This is an A minor triad. And this is a G minor triad with G in the bass. And an A minor triad with G in the bass. In order for me to remember it, I can just think, okay, it's a triad, a tone up from the root. So if the root is G, a tone up is A, so A minor. When the backing track moves in B, a tone up from B is basically C sharp, and I can use the same trick. And when it goes in E flat, a tone up from E flat is F. And again. So now if I have four bars of G minor, harmonically, it doesn't have to be boring. So when you have, you know, that's kind of boring. So harmony in theory, in this case, is telling me what else can I can do. But there is more to it. We can extend this idea because we also just looked at this triad, G, B flat, D, which gives us G minor, and this triad, which gives us A minor. Actually, if you look at it, any group of these three notes played in a sequence is a triad. So if I take B flat, D, and F, that's a B flat triad major. And combined with a G in the bass, I basically, I'm basically creating a G minor 7. 
if I take D, F, and A, that's a D minor triad. And it's spelled in the fifth, flat seven, and nine from the perspective of G. So actually combined, I, that's why a slash chord. I could not really say, okay, that's a G minor or a G major because the third is missing. It's a suspended chord of, of a sort. But it's also true that when I play it next to a G minor, it's still going to give you a perception that we are in a minor key. F, A, and C spells F major triad. A, C, and A spells A minor triad. C, E, and G spells C major triad. Then E, G, and B flat spells E diminished. And I combine them all. I can combine them all with the, uh, the G in the bass. So in other words, harmonically, over G minor as a chord, I can actually create all sorts of variation of the G minor chord utilizing slash chords. I, the key of G, I summed them up, summed them up here, but uh, at some point we, will like, we should have some sort of um, system, let's put it that way, in order to remember. And if you think about it, we're looking at something that starts from the flat three, major triad, something that starts from the two minor triad, something that starts from the fourth major triad, fifth minor triad, flat seven major triad, and diminished is from the sixth. Of course, like it's going to take a little bit of time to remember these kind of things by interval, but let's take just for example, just, uh, you know, a few. In the key of G, we said, okay, from the second, I can have the, the A minor triad, like, you know, like I just showed you. But even if only, uh, let's say I'm going to remember, try and remember that from the flat three, I can have a major triad. Let's move everything in a different key. Let's move it to the key of A. This, the, the idea of third, fourth, fifth, etc. is actually pretty simple. This is A Dorian. This is one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven. So from the two, we have a minor triad, so B minor. With the bass of A. In this case, I actually I can use just the empty strings. And we also know that from the flat three, I can have a major triad. That's a C triad, or a C triad. So that's A minor, B minor, C major. And I'm sure you heard this kind of harmony. And as you can imagine, if I had four bars of A, which statically would be kind of boring, That's rather boring. But if I start moving the chord around, it's still A and it's still a Dorian type of sound because all these triads are contained in the Dorian scale. So it's not gonna mm, compromise the, um, the melody, whatever the melody is. I can even go farther, so I know that from the uh, from the flat three I have major, so in this case, like here is a C triad with the bass away. I know that from the fourth uh, also I have major, so in this case it would be D, and I know that E minor also like so from the fifth it would work. So have a look. I'll show you how it won't compromise. I'm gonna start from A. <coughs> A minor triad, B minor triad, C major triad, D major triad, E minor triad, and back, and that's a G triad. I'll play to you so you can see what it sounds like. Which is going to be based on Dorian minor pentatonic and eventually melodic minor.
hope uh, I hope you find this uh, interesting as much as I do. Uh, ultimately, as I said, I wanted to kind of explain the logic that you can use sometimes in order to create maybe like pagan tracks that are focused on the practice of something very specific, like in this case. And uh, also like uh, getting the point across of how harmony and theory is not just, you know, just the uh, old uh, kind of useless things. It's got some, once you start understanding these kind of things, which is kind of maths in a way at the end of the day, you can have some very practical application and from an harmonic point of view, so chords, it can really make, you know, your chord are playing a little bit more interesting. And again, now I'm jazzing it up in a way, but easily, you know, can apply this to a more popish kind of thing. By the way, I'm a little bit out of tune by now, but... You write something like this, you put a singer on top of it, you got a song, you know? <laughs> so, it's just that, yeah, you can, sometimes you get to these things by ears in a way, but they're never complete. You might find out two or three sounds out of Dorian instead, like I'm giving you six for a start. And then, you know, you choose the two or three that you like, you know, it's so much better when you have the bigger picture and then it's your call, you know, rather than just trying everything by ears. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. I hope you learned something in the process. Uh, again, thank you to the patron who are supporting this project. Uh, for PDFs related even to my previous lessons, please uh, feel free to either to subscribe to the Patreon page or please visit my website. I'll leave the links in the description. And until next time, goodbye.